With two weeks left to go here in the regular season, there is not much margin for error for the St. Louis Dragons. For the first time all year, we have sole possession of first place in the division, but not by much. The Niners and the Seahawks are both half a game behind us. Today, we head out to Los Angeles for Sunday Night Football against the LA Rams as we look to keep first place in the NFC West alive. Last episode, we had one of our biggest regular season wins ever, beating the Seahawks 27-24. We also had a prospect profile going over the offensive and defensive linemen, and today we're going to wrap up prospect profiles for this year, going over the linebackers and defensive backs in this draft class. But before that, I want to take a look at the current situation here for the Dragons, coming off a huge win against Seattle, 27-24. The Seahawks led this division race by as much as three games. However, they have gotten hammered by the injury bug. Their top two quarterbacks, Tyler Nguyen and Bryson Bowen, are both out for the remainder of the regular season. That forced them to start Zach Wilson against us. This was Zach Wilson's first start in over four years. The last time he started an NFL game was back in season one when he was on our team at QB. All things considered, you know what? He really wasn't that bad. He certainly didn't lose Seattle the game, but he also didn't necessarily win them the game either. He's going to have to win the division and get a playoff spot for them, though, with the other two quarterbacks, of course, out. Along with the fact that we're competing with the Niners and Seahawks for the division, we're also competing with them for wild card spots. The NFC is super deep. There's nine teams in the running for the playoffs. The Dallas Cowboys have the number one seed pretty much locked up. They're the only team in the NFC East who's been good this year. And then after that, it is pure chaos. Every other division in the NFC is super competitive with no clear leader in the doghouse. In the NFC South, the Falcons, Panthers, and Saints are three of the four teams in the conference with double-digit wins. In the NFC West, us, San Francisco, and Seattle are within half a game of each other. And currently, we as a division hold that last seventh spot with San Francisco. That's not to mention the Lions and the Packers who are also right on our tail with Detroit leading the NFC North by one game over the Packers despite Green Bay beating the Lions last week. So before we keep going and look at our matchup here against the Rams, we do have a prospect profile. We're going to start with the linebackers in this year's class, and I think that's an interesting position for us. Of course, Devin White just fractured his foot last week. He's going to be out for the rest of the regular season into the playoffs. We have Owen Popo, who we needed to step up last week, and boy did he, winning the NFC Defensive Player of the Week. But he's also on the last year of his deal. He is not under contract next year. Of course, currently playing under the franchise tag. Now, we've got other talented players at linebacker with Barahona, Fofana, Simpson, and Ryan Nada, the first rounder who we drafted at safety, who's going to be playing a lot of sub-linebacker the rest of the year. Off-ball linebacker is a very important position in our defensive scheme, as is edge rusher. And there's both types of players here in this linebacker class. We'll start with one of the top pass rushers being Amari Adai out of Syracuse, who's likely to go in the top 10. You look at somebody with good size and length, 6'5", long arms, and he's really well-rounded as a pass rusher across the board. He can win in a variety of different ways with power and finesse, and he's a great run stopper as well. For everybody who misses out on him, there are other good options, including Alejandro Hernandez out of Florida State. He's a really talented player in his own right. He's a little bit bigger than Adai, a little bit stronger, but he's just as quick, athletic, and explosive. He has scheme versatility. He can play with his hand in the dirt or standing up, and I think because of that, he's going to be a good use of probably a top 15 pick. Behind him, Reynard Rocco out of Auburn is another intriguing player. I think he's a little bit more raw as a pass rusher than those top two guys, but I think his athletic traits are a little bit more intriguing. And if you want to go for the ceiling pick, somebody who you're going to need to develop a little bit, I think Ruoko could be your guy. A possible French first rounder who could be in the Dragons range is Bobo Ray Ray out of Georgia. He's more of a do-it-all linebacker. He can cover. He can stop the run. He can get after the quarterback. He really doesn't have one thing that he's great at, though. He's kind of the jack-of-all-trades, master of none. But I think he could be a good player. Junior Telford, Justin Portman, and Trevor Harthy are among some of the other names to watch. And then at right outside linebacker. Again, a lot of talented edge rushers at the top. We'll start with Pop Armstrong out of Florida. 
6'4", 265. He reminds me a lot of T.J. Watt in the sense that he doesn't necessarily win with quickness, but he's refined as a pass rusher. He can stop the run. He can cover. I'm not saying he's going to be as good as T.J. Watt, but I think he has a similar skill set, and I think teams are going to like him for the same reasons how Watt is obviously one of the best defensive players in the league. Omo Kaya Okamali from UCLA is another player to watch out for. I really like what he can do against the run. He's been a little inconsistent as a pass rusher throughout his career, but he's broken out this year. Another guy who's kind of do-it-all he can cover, but he is a little bit undersized. There's also Shadon Hazelwood out of USF. Another guy who could sneak into the first round. This is somebody who is also undersized. 6'2", 245, but he's athletic, quick off the edge. Other names to watch out for here include Luke Henley and Kyler Birch as we move inside. Not a great group of off-ball linebackers, which makes an incentive for the Dragons to re-sign a guy like Owen Popo. But I do think that Adonis Bazana out of Kentucky is the name to watch. He can cover, he's athletic, and I think he's a little bit more instinctive than some of these other linebackers who are all projected to go into the third to fourth round range. Let's take a look at the secondary now, a position group where the Dragons have heavily invested draft capital over the years, and I won't be surprised to see us do it again. Cam Lucifer's really good, but you're going to have to pay him soon, and there's already a lot of other guys on this team who need extensions. Jeff Okuda's a free agent at the end of the year. So is Demor Diggins. Ron Rikus Barber is still really raw. We've used a lot of picks on safeties, but our starters are Malik Hooker, who's older, and then Samasoni Saluni, who's broken out this year. But again, you're going to have to pay him soon. Ryan Nada, the first rounder last year, is probably going to be more of a linebacker long term. And then Jalen Bourgeois, another high pick. He hasn't really shown a ton of flashes so far. So I'm not fully sold on anybody being a long-term piece in the secondary because we've got a lot of guys to extend. And while I do view players such as Cam Lucifer, Samasone Saluni, Jeff Okuda, and others as possible building blocks for the future, we're going to have to make some tough decisions with this group, which means that we're going to have to restockpile in terms of defensive backs. So because of that... I wouldn't be surprised to see the Dragons use another top 100 pick on a DB. Probably not a first rounder per se, but I think somewhere on day two, it's very realistic. I think it's a pretty average defensive back class. It's not great, but it's not bad either. There is still plenty of talent in the first round and beyond at both cornerback and safety and some intriguing players that I want to look at. If the Dragons do use a high pick on a DB, I think it probably would more likely than not be a corner rather than a safety with Jeff Okuda getting older, Cam Lucifer and Demore Diggins needing extensions. I would suspect the Dragons could consider corner in the top 100. The top corner in this class is projected to be Juju Banks out of Tulane. Really, really intriguing player. I like his ball skills. Sticky in man coverage. He's physical and press, and I think he's going to be a really good player. I think Adrian Hoker from Indiana could also go in the top 10 with Banks. Hoker's a little bit smaller, but I think he's a little bit smarter. He's the best zone corner in this class. I think he's a little bit scheme dependent, but in specific zone heavy schemes, I think he could be one of the best corners in the entire league. Some corners who should be available for the Dragons' top pick include Desirion Sowell out of Wake Forest. He's another zone corner. He's a little bit undersized, but I think he's talented. Not great in man-to-man -man coverage, though. He does struggle with bigger physical receivers, which could be an issue. Sherman Poodles from LSU is a really intriguing player to me. He's got great size and length. Six foot three. He's got incredible ball skills, and that's a big asset for his game. A little inconsistent in coverage, but he knows how to track the football. Armani Brown II out of Ohio State also has phenomenal ball skills with six interceptions this year for the Buckeyes. I think he's a little bit more consistent in coverage than Poodles, but I also don't think he's got the athletic traits and upside. K.J. Bowman from Alabama I think is pretty good. Liam Travers from North Carolina is also a fun player. This is somebody who's played both sides of the ball in college. He knows how to get to the football because of his wide receiver background, but I suspect that he will play primarily corner at the next level. Unfortunately, I don't think this is an overly deep cornerback group, especially after the first round or two, which is unfortunate because I think round two, round three would be the prime spot for us to get one, but I'm not sure if the value is there. I think it's a solid safety class, not overly top-heavy. We've seen some ridiculously good safety prospects enter the league in the past couple of years. I'm not sure if there's going to be any mega stars this year, but there are some good players. I don't think the Dragons are going to use a super high pick, though, on safety since we've drafted one in the top two rounds three years in a row. 
I do like Isaac Artest out of Miami and Jonathan Bowie out of North Carolina. Artest is a good cover safety. Bowie is somebody who can stack the box. Harrison Hayward Jr. is very versatile. You can put him at either safety spot, box linebacker, slot corner. And then at strong safety, Keyfon Branch from Michigan, 6'4", 220 pounds. Another guy who probably has his best work in the box. I don't think he's entirely dissimilar to his former Michigan teammate, Ryan Nada, who we used the first round pick on last year. Neville Ronan from Michigan State is a smaller guy, 5'8", but he's absurdly talented. Rocky Sanders as well, I think, is a pretty good player. But again, I don't think it's overly deep at safety after the first three or so rounds. So that does it for the entire draft class. We've now gone through every position. Really fun group. I'm excited to get into the offseason eventually. But right now our focus is now fully on the playoff run. The Dragons at 9-5-1 looking to stay in first place in the division. Our opponent is the LA Rams who are the one team in the NFC West who has not been in the race. They are 4-11. They are really bad. They are presumably playing for draft positioning and could finish as high as the second overall pick. But the Rams also haven't beaten us in years. I feel like this would be not so much a program building win because it's kind of hard to build the culture when the roster is already really old, but this would make their season feel a little bit better. They nearly beat us first time around into overtime. They should have beaten us if not for managing the clock poorly at the end. We kind of stole that win away from them and the Rams are looking for revenge. As I mentioned, this is an older roster that they kind of banked on the older guys staying good, and that hasn't materialized. And that all starts at quarterback with Deshaun Watson, who's taken a big drop-off from the first two seasons he was with the Rams to this year. It's a shame because it couldn't have happened to a better guy off the field. Deshaun Watson is such a noble citizen, and it really sucks to see him fall off like this. I mean, you just hate seeing good people fall, don't you? Nick Chubb and Cooper Cup are also not the same as they once were, but they're still good players. Aaron Donald's really the only older player on this roster who hasn't missed a beat, which is odd because he's the oldest of the group at 36, but he is still one of the best pass rushers in the entire league. The Rams do have some good, fun, young players, but their roster as a whole is just not aged well. We have a breakout player as well. Unsurprisingly, it's Owen Popo. I kind of figured it would be him after replacing Devin White as the main linebacker and ultimately winning the NFC's Defensive Player of the Week with 15 tackles and a strip sack that he recovered himself and took to the house for a scoop and score. And that play might have been one of the differences of the entire game. Popo's going to have a lot on his chest now, being the green dot of the defense. But I think he's good enough to handle it. And if he plays well, he very well could increase his price tag in terms of extension negotiations. We also know we're facing off against a rival. And it's a little bit deeper with the Rams, being that this is the team who moved out of St. Louis to Los Angeles. The Rams have really struggled with us over the past couple of seasons. I don't remember the last time the Rams have beaten us. I don't know what they have since they traded for Deshaun Watson, since we seemingly own anybody who is a woman assaulter, which is probably the best thing you can be if you're a defense. So let's get this show on the road. Week 17, the 9-5-1 St. Louis Dragons face off against the 4-11 Los Angeles Rams. This is a super important regular season game for us as we look to hold on to first place in the division and the three seed. This is also an important game for the Rams, not in terms of like the playoff race or anything, but the fact that this is their Super Bowl I imagine they kind of want to win it. Since this is the Sunday night game, all of the other important games for us have already ended. We're going to go over those at halftime. Rams start with the ball as Watson goes up the middle for DeAndre Washington, who is now the wide receiver one of this team. He's developed into a really strong player. The Rams are going to have to eventually pay him pretty soon, though, being that he's nearing the end of his rookie deal. Third and ten, Watson under a ton of pressure. He's going to outrun Bonnet. And Watson gets the first down before getting clobbered. Somebody needs to give that man a massage. Good run, though, nonetheless for Watson as the Rams are able to move the chains. Now from the 44 with Washington in motion, it's a play action. Watson will fire. It's hauled in by Cooper Cup, who hasn't exactly aged gracefully now at 34 years old. But he is still a productive starter for this team as their second receiver. Second and eight, Watson is a wide open man. Nobody's going to cover Romeo Dubs, and he has flipped into the end zone for a touchdown. 
A quick start for the Los Angeles Rams as they march down the field and lead it 7-0. Here's the Dragons offense, of course, led by Puma Whitlock, the fourth-year quarterback out of Ohio State as he connects with Jamison Williams, who could have gotten more yards if he was able to keep the feet in, but still a good conversion nonetheless. Third and seven now. Puma looks to throw it. Looking downfield, he's got Jamo wide open. The pass was overthrown a little bit. Jamo could have taken that to the house, but he makes a nice play on the ball to ensure he gets the first down. First and goal now from the three. Puma looks to throw it. He's got an open rushing lane and takes it. Untouched into the end zone. Walking the red carpet here in Hollywood as the Dragons tie it at seven. Both offenses march down the field. They score on their initial possessions. And now the Rams get it here with a third down and eight from the 23. Watson looks to throw it under pressure up the middle. What a throw for Romeo Dubs. Say what you want about the man off the field. But on the field, he's been almost as bad, except for that throw. That was a really nice play. Five seconds left in the quarter. Here is Tavorian Tryon, who loses about a yard. Owen Popo brings him down. That's a tackle for loss, which helps him for his breakout challenge. Up the middle, Watson for Cup with a spin move, and he gets it to the 18-yard line. These defensive backs are getting dusted after the catch by 34-year-old Cooper Cup. What is happening? Second and one, Nick Chubb is going backwards. Simeon Bonnet brings him down for a loss of two as Ojolari is dinged up. Obviously hasn't been the year that Simeon Bonnet was hoping for, but maybe he can turn it up here before the playoffs. Him playing like a defensive player of the year type guy would change the Dragon season outlook. Third and three, look at Chubb fighting forward as he brings it to the eight-yard line. The Rams really have not been able to get the run game going at all, but that was a good play by Chubb. The Rams have been trying to punch it in. Third and goal. Chubb with the handoff, and he gets nothing. Wrapped up by a handful of guys, but that's Chuck Reed who led the way, one of the backup safeties. Fourth and goal. The Rams are going to go for it. They haven't been able to run it on first and goal, second and goal, or third and goal, but fourth time's the charm. Chubb breaks a tackle. He's in for the score, and the Rams lead it 14-7. So finally, they're able to punch it in. And they're up by a touchdown. Third and inches for the Dragons. It's a handoff for Joe Mixon. The recently signed veteran with a juke move. And Mixon fights forward to the 47. Good run there for Joe Mixon, who's honestly really played well since being signed here. He doesn't look old and slow at all. He looks like he's never been better. Puma under pressure from Donald and friends. Has to throw it away. Nobody was open. Puma's been really efficient so far, 8 for 10, but that time he couldn't find anybody as Donna leads the way. The Dragons are going to look to kick here. 54-yard try for Cameron Dicker. The kicker is good, barely. But hey, 3 points is 3 points, and that'll make it 14 to 10. Every drive so far in this game has ended in a score. I will say, the Dragons' offense is better in the first half, and their defense is better in the second half. We'll see if that trend holds today. Watson up the middle. Nice throw. Hall then for a first down. It's Romeo Dubs again. He's gotten off to a strong start, bringing it to the 44-yard line. Two and a half to go now in half number one. Watson hands it off for Chubb, and he is thrown down by another former Georgia Bulldog. Devontae Wyatt brings him down. Nine carries, 14 yards for Chubb. Quite the far cry from Kenneth Walker, who had like 125 yards on the ground last week. Here's Cooper Cup, breaks a tackle, and he gets injured as he's lit up, but not before gaining 11. Cup will go to the locker room. His day likely over for the Rams, a big loss for their offense. Third and three now and around midfield. Watson under pressure. He is sacked. A linebacker blitz, and Owen Popo is there in the backfield without Deshaun's consent. And there you go. Owen Popo has completed the breakout challenge here in just the first half. He'll move up to superstar development. Very exciting. The Dragons get the ball back as well. Here's the rookie, Milan Santa. Tries to spin away from the safety. Alex Welby Jr., who brings him down. Dragons call their first timeout. They've still got two in their back pocket, along with 35 seconds. Third and 10. Puma on the run, under pressure. Gets it, but it's dropped. That was a perfect throw, but Colin Robinson, who's back in the lineup after missing a few with an injury, cannot hold on. Rams back with it. 20 to go in the half. Watson fires for his go-to guy today, Romeo Dubs. Third and 10 now. Watson gets it over to the tight end camp is Shakabi, who is out of bounds at the 48 with four seconds. So this is going to leave more than enough room for the Rams to go for a Hail Mary. 
Watson's got the arm strength to possibly get it there as he will look to throw it. He is under a little bit of pressure and is lit up by Owen Popo. And that'll wrap up the first half. Both offenses started off really strong, but each of the defenses seemed to pick it up as the half went along. Rams lead it 14 to 10. I told you the Rams were going to come out to play today. Let's take a look at how these NFC playoff contenders are doing, but first we'll start with an old-fashioned tank bowl. The Titans won their first game of the year last week, but are unable to turn it into a winning streak as they lose to the Bucks. Of course, these two teams have first-round QBs from Puma Whitlock's draft class, but I would expect both of these teams with new QBs next year. In Pittsburgh, the Steelers are now 13-3, led by rookie Ty Poland, who continues his exceptional rookie season, getting the win over the Chargers. As for the other NFC playoff teams, San Francisco loses to Detroit, Seattle loses to Cleveland. So both of our NFC West rivals lose. That means if we win this game against the Rams today, we clinch the division. That's pretty exciting. While that's good news, the rest of the NFC playoff contenders all won. Falcons won, Panthers won, Saints won, Packers won, Lions won. That's not so good. So our chances of winning the division go up, but our wild card chances are all hurt by these results. But that's not going to matter if we win this game here. Things don't get easy for us next week. We play against Green Bay, who might be fighting for a playoff spot. So it would be nice if we clean up the division now. Let's see if we can do it. Currently trailing 14 to 10, but the Dragons do start with the ball here in the second half. It's been a solid start for Puma Whitlock. He's missed a few throws. The offense hasn't gotten a ton of big plays, and you can't let that happen. Puma loses 16 on the sack from Josh Allen, the veteran pass rusher who, of course, almost signed with the Dragons a handful of years ago. Third and 20. Puma looks downfield for Weaver, and he is lit up. It's Weldy who gets the ball away from him, and the Dragons are going to have to punt it. So the Rams get it back, possibly looking to add to their lead. Very strong first half from Deshaun Watson, unfortunately, as he has an open man downfield. It's Romeo Dubs again. He brings it to the 42 as Steve Avila, the guard, is hurt on the play for the Rams. But still a huge gain for L.A. And their offense seems to be back in business. Play action. Watson is thrown down by Malik Hooker for a loss of about nine. A hooker massaging Deshaun Watson. Where have I seen this before? Third and 12. Watson is intercepted. Demore Diggins picks it off. Looking to make a play here on the return. And he will as he's pushed out of bounds. But not before bringing it to the 43. L.A. must be Diggins' second home. Every time Demore Diggins is in this stadium, whether it's against the Rams or the Chargers, he seems to go off. So the Dragons get it off the turnover. Puma, sacked by Donald, loses the ball, and it's picked up by Donald. A one-play drive for the Dragons off the turnover, and they turn it over themselves. At 36 years old, Aaron Donald gets the sack, forces the fumble, recovers the fumble, and overall, this works out well for the Rams because they get a new set of downs. Third and seven, Watson on the run, will get the first down again, outrunning defenders as he's eventually wrapped up by Jeff Okuda. Now from the 36, here's Watson, looks to throw it. He's got Washington, he brings it to the 21. And right now it feels like the Rams are getting all the momentum since the fumble from Aaron Donald. Following play, Chubb with the handoff, breaks a tackle, he's got room and is in for a first down at the 10 as now Nandi Sanaga is dinged up. That's not ideal because the Dragons are already without Ojolari. Second and goal, play action, Watson under pressure, and he is brought down. Simeon Bonnet leads the way, and he is joined by Devontae Wyatt for the sack. So now it's a third and goal for the Rams at the five. Can they punch it in? Watson empty, looks to throw it under pressure, sacked again. Trajan Bleichenden, who had a pair of sacks against Seattle last week, gets another one here. Bleichenden, red hot here at the end of the season as he makes another play. And that's going to lead to a field goal for the Rams. So the Dragons' defense gets to stop in the red zone. They still only trail by one score as it's 17-10. St. Louis gets it back. Handoff for Darwin Juskins. He's got room to the left side. Looks to juke away from the defender as he gets a first down. The Dragons' run game has been decent today. They really haven't tried to establish the run that much in this one, but they've ran it fairly well. And right as I say that, Darwin Juskins gets to meet the big fella, Aaron Donald, who's in the backfield forcing a loss of three. 
Third and long now. Puma under pressure. Rolls to the right. He's got Weaver. But it is broken up late. So the Rams defense gets the stop. That's Benjamin St. Juiced. And now L.A. gets it back up by seven. Watson looks to throw it. He is going to find his man. It's Cam Biz Shakabi to the 46. It's now the rookie right tackle. Adarion Fuller is hurt. Third and six. Watson is picked again. Ryan Nada, the rookie out of the University of Michigan, picks it off. And the Dragons defense gets their second interception of the quarter. The Dragons defense has stepped up. Here in the third with a pair of turnovers, but the offense has got to capitalize off of it. On third and four, Juskins only gets a yard. It's Weldy who brings him down. And now the Dragons have a really interesting decision on fourth down to start the fourth. You know how this team loves to be aggressive. They're going to keep the offense out on the field as Milan Santa barely gets the first down. The rookie Santa really struggled with those short yardage plays earlier in the year, but he's really gotten better there. And now he meets Aaron Donald. And he's injured as well. It's a minor foot injury for Milan Santa, who won't go to the locker room, but he will get it checked out on the trainer's table. So he'll be out for a little bit as it's now third and five with eight to go. Donald in the zone. Puma's got to get rid of it. And it's caught somehow by Arturo Modelo for a first down. Following play, Puma's in the zone now as he looks to throw it. He goes short for Modelo. He's got room, outrunning the defenders, and he takes it all the way to the house. It's Modelo time. Arturo Modelo is in for a score, and we are tied at 17. Modelo, the NFL's leading receiver, showing his ability after the catch, and this game is knotted up. Rams get it back, eight and a half to go here in the fourth. We'll see if Deshaun Watson and Los Angeles can take the lead as it's third and six. And that one is broken up. Jalen Bourgeois got a hand on it. He's getting some snaps with Malik Hooker a little dinged up. And the second year pro out of UCLA is there to make a big play. So now the Dragons get it back. They can potentially take the lead as it is second and eight. Puma still in the zone, rolls out to the right. And he's got Weaver wide open to the sideline as Milan Santa re-aggravates his foot injury. That's not good. Clock is ticking, under seven to go, second and six. Puma looks short, he's got Jamison Williams breaking tackles to the 27. The Dragons are now definitely in field goal range, but I imagine they would love more than three. It's a toss for Juskins on second and five, he loses four. The Dragons ran the ball pretty well in the first half. They've tried to do it more in the second half, but it hasn't really worked. Third and nine now, Puma looking downfield, good coverage by the Rams. Nobody was open, so he was kind of hoping Jamo would outrun the defender. But unfortunately, it doesn't happen, and the offense is going to be forced to settle for three as Cameron Dicker, the kicker, splits the uprights from 44, and St. Louis is up by three. The Rams get it back with five to go. Their offense was great in the first half, and they have been non-existent in the second half. But all they need is one big drive to regain the lead. Chubb on second down, breaks a tackle, Gets the first and then some as he's wrapped up by the defensive tackle, DeJuan Overton, who makes it all the way down the field. You should be having your linebackers and safeties making that play, not the defensive tackle. Watson, under pressure, he is sacked. Simeon Bonnet brings him down for a loss of seven. Say what you want about Bonnet's season, but he has been money here in the second half. Third and three, Watson under pressure, goes short. Not a first down. It's only a gain of two for Chubb. He's wrapped up by Nada. What do the Rams do on fourth and one? I feel like when you're that close this late in the game, you got to go for it. But they're going to punt it with Matt Ariza, Deshaun Watson's favorite punter. As Colin Robinson will return it, he looks to send it to the left side, breaks a tackle, and he gets it to around the 27. I feel like punting it there is a really lame decision by Sean McVay, another guy who likes to be aggressive, but that's plain not to lose. The Dragons are going to look to choose from clock and finish the game as Mixon loses two immediately. A big tackle there by Witt. Second and 12. Rams not using their timeouts yet as it's Juskins up the middle. Gets blocks and nearly gets the first as he gains around 10. Ernest Jones hurt on the play for the Rams. It sucks for them, but the clock stops. They don't have to use a timeout. Third and two now. Puma looks to throw it and it is broken up looking for Weaver. So an interesting decision, choosing to throw the ball there, and it backfires. The Rams get the stop, and their offense will get one more chance. They still have the two-minute warning ahead of them, and they also have all three timeouts. 
Watson on first down. He is nearly intercepted. Diggins had his second pick of the game right in his hands, but could not come down with it. Second and ten. Watson up the middle. He fires. It's caught by Washington. That's a first down, and that'll bring us to the two-minute warning. Big play there for L.A. Now from the 38, they're not that far away from field goal range. And again, all they theoretically need is three. Watson under pressure. Sacked again. Devontae Wyatt brings him down. Bought it amongst others with pressure as well. The Dragons' pass rush has been inconsistent this year, but they've had two strong weeks in a row. Here's Tryon wide open on the wheel route. Owen Popo slow to react, which is rare for him. Popo's game is about his speed and quickness, but that time not so much. Watson now gets it over to Dubs. He brings it to the 27, and with under a minute to go, the Rams' offense is in a groove. Watson scrambles with it, and he will get around four as Bonnet is hurt. Dragons have to call a timeout, which stops the clock, and now the Dragons are without their three best edge rushers. Bonnet might be able to return to the game pretty soon. The Dragons very well may need him, especially with how good he has been in the second half. Second and eight, Watson up the middle. Another play for Romeo Doves, who's been on fire today as the Rams finally get to call their first timeout. Down at the 11 with 38 seconds left. Watson looks to throw it. He's got Tryon, and he brings it to the two. They are so close. They can just taste it. Calling their second timeout. Second and goal. Blitz on the way as that one is broken up by Saluni. The Dragons want to send pressure. A sack here would be gigantic as they continue to stack the box. Third and one from the two. It's Chubb. Breaks a tackle. Gets the first, but he's not in the end zone. Clock ticks. Under 20 seconds to go now as the Rams spike it. They've still got a timeout in their back pocket. The Rams struggled on the goal line earlier, though. Can they get it in here? Second and goal from the one. Chubb with room is in. And the Rams take the lead with 13 seconds to go. A big drive from Deshaun Watson and the Rams. And the Dragons trail by four as it's Robinson on the kick return. He's got blocks. Robinson with one man to beat. Can't quite get by him. A huge return for Colin Robinson. But there's only five seconds. The Dragons are going to try to run two plays here as Weaver hangs on. Timeout immediately with just one second to go. And now the Dragons are going to need to take a shot for the end zone here down by four. It's certainly possible at the 26 as Puma Whitlock looks to call an audible. This is it. If the Dragons score here, they win the division. Looking deep for Likely and it's broken up by Ernest Jones. And the Rams hang on to win it 24-20 to with a really bad play at the end of the game. We'll talk about this last play in depth in just a second on what the Dragons were trying to do and how it failed because I think a lot of you are going to be confused that it looked like there was a receiver kind of open down the field but instead Puma's looking for Isaiah Likely. So let's look at the replay here. Look at Griffin Weaver in the slot. It looks like he's wide open but he's really not because the other corner on the outside is going to notice the ball is coming and make a play. That left outside corner is basically covering both of those receivers. So instead, Puma's going to look for Isaiah Likely. None of our receivers are contested catch guys. Weaver isn't. Modelo isn't. Jamo's tall, but that's not really his game. So we're looking for Isaiah Likely here. The idea was that he was going to be ahead of the linebacker as he catches that pass. And he only has to break one tackle from the 170-pound three safety which he should be able to theoretically do. The problem was that Puma Whitlock threw the ball too early and the linebacker was able to get a hand on the ball. If I were to run that play over again, I think sending Likely for the end zone would have just been the better strategy rather than banking on him getting open up the middle of the field and hoping for a play after the catch. So basically to summarize, I know it was a bad play, but I don't want to break character. Deshaun Watson had a really good first half. Wasn't so good in the second half, but that last drive, he was clutch, ultimately leading the Rams to their first Super Bowl championship in five years. Or at least that's what their organization and fans are going to think. Puma Whitlock was fine. He wasn't, like, great or anything, but he didn't necessarily make any huge mistakes other than the fumble. Run defense was really good, though. Nick Chubb was really not much of the factor. Our run game started off strong, but certainly tailed off. 
Romeo Dubs had a big game. Modelo was pretty good. JMO was solid, and that's about it, receiving wise. Defensively, started slow, then went really well. I thought the pass rush, really for both teams, especially us, was great. Wyatt had three TFLs. Bonnet had three TFLs. Owen Popo had a great game. We forced the two turnovers. But that last drive of the game, our defense could not hold on, and unfortunately, that ended up being our undoing. Owen Popo does go up in development. That's exciting. He's going to have some superstar abilities now. His price tag is also presumably going to go up, and deservedly so. He's had two great games in a row, and I'm pretty confident that he'll be able to keep it up with Devin White out of the lineup. And if we do re-sign Popo, eventually he's going to be the guy with Devin White getting older, and he's showing that he can handle the responsibility of leading the defense. Despite all of that, though, we obviously don't get the win, which is disappointing. It does make us feel a little bit better that we're still going to be in first place for the division with both Seattle and San Francisco losing, but we also have less margin for error in the wild card race because all the other wild card teams won. We have a couple new injuries as well. Namdi Sanaga dislocates his elbow. He's going to be out for a few weeks. That certainly sucks. He's a good rotational pass rusher, but we've got other guys along the defensive line who I think can replace his production. The bigger injury, though, is Milan Santa, who broke his foot. The odd thing about that is when he initially got injured, his re-injury risk was high. So because of that, I told EA to not put him back in the game. They put him back in, breaks his foot, done for the year. A disappointing end to what was an up-and-down rookie year for Santa, but I feel like he's shown a lot of good things as of recent. 830 all-purpose yards. He's going to go on injured reserve, and now we're going to have an extra roster spot opened up. We already saw all the scores, but here's a look at the Monday night one as well between the Texans and the Patriots. As for the players of the week, it's Amari August, Josh Allen, Jalen Johnson, and David Long. So with one week to go, the NFC playoff picture gets really interesting. We are currently the four seed at 9-6-1, and one, but we're only half a game out for the division and the wild card. San Francisco and Seattle at 9-7 and seven are right on our tails. They're both half a game behind in the division, and neither of those teams are currently in the playoff picture with Green Bay currently holding the seventh seed. And that's who we play against in Week 18. The winner of our matchup against the Packers is in the playoffs, and if we win, of course we clinch the division. The loser of that game still has a chance, depending on what happens with the Niners in Seattle. The Niners have to play against a good Browns team, and Seattle is Zach Wilson starting a quarterback. So there's a world where we get in even if we lose, but obviously we do not want to chance it. It would only take one of those two teams winning to knock us out of the playoffs with a loss against the Packers. So there's a whole lot at stake in Week 18. It's basically a playoff game for us. So hopefully we can win. And, well, if not, that's going to be kind of sad. So that'll wrap up the episode. I hope you guys enjoyed. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you are new. Peace out.